Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you, Steve, for that uh, overly generous introduction. I wish my mother were here. <laughs> she would believe every word you said about me. And I want to thank um, uh, my friend and uh, your law firm to hosting me and hosting this event. I was actually, by the way, I was in Seattle with Nelson um, just a few days ago. And uh, then I flew to China, then I got back to uh, last night, and this morning. So. And uh, again, and, uh, you have a beautiful office in Seattle and, uh, and the Central District. And um, it's so wonderful to see so many friends and uh, some, uh, some new, some old. And I particularly want to mention uh, three uh, people or more. One is my dear friend and my mentor, and uh, over the show, it's uh, just so great to see you. Mm -hmm. I was an old student, he was a young professor, <laughs> and, uh, 30 years ago at Berkeley. I, I really think that my experience as a research assistant for you is one of the defining moments in my career, and it's so great, so great to see you over. And also, I'm particularly happy to see my dear friend, Emma Chen, who, as you know, that she served almost in every ball uh, important uh, in the China relations and playing a really crucial role to help building bridge. And uh, so wonderful to see Emma. And, uh, and uh, the third is not just one individual. I'm so happy to see a group of my uh, Brookings uh, young colleagues. They, they all served as my research assistants over the past few years. Uh, most of them actually or five and uh, uh, ending or graduating from uh, Columbia. So wonderful to see the next generation uh, 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 emerging and, uh, and uh, so wonderful to see you again. Thank you very much. Now, my topic is about the uh, think tank. Uh, basically, I want the book wants to address three questions. First, can China's think tanks, especially because of their rapid, recent rapid development, serve as an important window through which China watchers can observe policy discourse and the decision making in the country. Secondly, is, is Chinese social science research in general and the think tank community in particular dynamic and pluralistic? And finally, does present day China have great thinkers? My answer is very clear to these three questions. Yes, yes, and yes. And uh, as uh, Steve said, uh, this could be controversial, so my presentation wants to tell you why. Now, before that, uh, let me give some background, uh, particular historical background. Uh, as we know, that uh, there's an ancient uh, uh, lineage or tradition, and uh, also uh, in terms of more recent resurgence. Uh, you can say that the think tank is not something completely foreign. You go back to 2,000 years ago. Uh, when you visit Confucius' temple, you will know at that time that uh, uh, with uh, Confucius or Mengzi, they, they are all surrounded by their disciples. Some of them serve as think tanks. Confucius himself could be a great uh, advisor or think tank founder uh, for the, uh, the, the, the emperor, or king, or whatever you call uh, uh, the system. So it's not a completely alien for China, but certainly the recent uh, several centuries, China did not continue that. We know that uh, during the first three decades or so uh, in, uh, in the PRC, we see strong leaders, but the very weak think tanks. For example, Mao uh, never liked intellectual, and certainly under his leadership, there's no any discussion about the think tanks. And when he launched the Cultural Revolution, he uh, also uh, early on the Great Leap Forward, and also the movement to build the so-called interior third front, this is in the 1960s, to try to move the major factories from coastal region to inland region, prepare for war with uh, uh, either United States or Soviet Union at that time. These decisions are all made by Mao himself alone, including to invite uh, uh, President Nixon uh, or King Pang in policy uh, 45 years ago. These are, again, it's not uh, decided by think tank or recommended by think tanks, even not recommended by his advisors, just the top leader decide uh, himself. The same thing with Deng Xiaoping, although Deng Xiaoping really improved the role of intellectuals, he started to respect intellectuals, so it really changed the 
uh, Mao's uh, policy uh, anti-intellectual uh, and uh, but on the other hand, he would rather listen to his daughters than any other scholars, and this is the main source for his advice. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, the his launch of reform, especially special economic zone in Shenzhen and later on in Shanghai, and also that the sending students to study in the West. You know, I'm one of the beneficiaries of the, uh, you know, really several million people now. Uh, also, the decision just by, made by. Deng Xiaoping alone. Maybe he got some of the recommendation uh, by one or two intellectuals, but largely his decision, he even could, you can even say he thought about that, he just used intellectual recommendation for his uh, major policy move. Now, this is a film, film uh, uh, the parade uh, in the celebration of the, I think, 60th anniversary of the PRC. Uh, each leader has a, has a uh, big culture, and uh, when the leader's culture comes to the Tiananmen Square, there's a sound. Each Leader has a son, Mao has the rise of Busan. Deng Xiaoping, the son is called Story of the Spring. I always uh, fascinated by the, the, uh, the some of the you know the, the what's it called the rhythm in the song. Uh, if those of you from China, you probably uh, will know that what I refer to. The song, if it goes like this, in the 19, early 1980s, at the springtime, an older man looked at the China's map and made a cycle. In that cycle become the driving force of China's economy, the engine of China's economic development. Ten years later, the same old man in his 90s looked at the same map and also springtime made a circle. That circle became the second engine of China's economic growth. Now isn't it bizarre that just the whole country, China, the whole development, just an old man in his 80s and the 90s, look at the map, made a circle, there's his change. But that's what exactly happened in China. You cannot miss the importance of the leader, having a strong leader, such as the, uh, you know, early on Mao and then the reform period and then. Now, these two stories, the springtime, we know that they refer to, what they refer to, the change. The first is the Shenzhen, the fish, fishing village. I was there, it's the, this is 24 hours ago, and um, uh, it was a fishing village, most people said, 37 years ago, but now become very much like Hong Kong. And uh, the second one is more impressive. Um, we look at Shanghai's photo. This is Pudong, Pudong's development. Of course, that was history. Now it's a different. Uh, people start to uh, emphasize uh, uh, think tanks, especially uh, uh, by Xi Jinping. Now, of course, start with Zhang Zemin and Xi Jinping. Now, but of course, there's some cynicism uh, in both China and the outside world, especially uh, in the Western world about the same thing. The numerous criticism has certain validities. For example, uh, think tank fever in China is a complete waste of financial resources. Uh, talk about Chinese think tanks only endorse this Chinese current faith through government policies rather than critically evaluated policy initiatives. And the four Chinese think tank tend to be set forum centric think tank. They only want to, uh, you know, organize or uh, convene major conferences. Not so much about the research centric think tanks. And that's some Chinese terms like you ku zi, tanks without thinkers, or ku duo zi zao, plenty of thinkers, but a little thinking. Now that tells you that the criticism of cynicism in China. And of course, there's a recent tightening of your control. There's no question about that through which the internet security law and foreign NGO laws and the national security laws uh, uh, as China adopted these laws in the past few years. Now, of course, Chinese may uh, argue that it's necess necessary, like the United States, to adopt some of the laws, but at least create some kind of uneasiness at this moment uh, by foreign NGOs or Chinese uh, uh, NGOs. So you do see this uh, kind of criticism, but I think they missed the mo major point that the think tank development is very, very important in China, has really a uh, far-reaching uh, uh, you know, impact to China and to outside world. And uh, so this is the background things I just uh, uh, want to emphasize. But I also want to quote uh, uh, some of the scholars, like uh, uh, a Chinese scholar, Zhu Xuefeng, and uh, uh, Tsinghua University. He actually said, foreign scholars superficially consider Chinese official think tanks to be government mouthpieces. But in fact, many of the, these Chinese research institutions themselves may not form the same ideology. 
and China's official think tanks sometimes openly criticize government policies. Now, for myself, I follow uh, Chinese politics very, very closely. I certainly agree with him. And uh, now, you look at the, uh, the think tank's role in the recent past, there are a lot of political dissent from the mainstream think tanks. Not talk about the, the, the more critical think tanks, even from main, critical, main think tanks in the past. The Central Party School and the Hu Yaobang actually is a driving force for political reform. Uh, this is the 90, later 1970s and early 1980s. A lot of ideas uh, really come from first from uh, China's Central Party School. Then also in the during uh, 1989 Tiananmen, we should not forget the think tanks such as the uh, uh, Institute of Political Science at the CARS and the uh, Yan Jiaqi, later he became a well-known dissident, still live overseas. And also the other one is Chen Yizhi. They are in the mainstream think tanks, but uh, certainly at that time, they express their different views. If happened this 20 or 30 years ago, what about now? Similarly, you do see some of the different views. And, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, and also, more recently, you probably heard the name uh, Yu Keping, the author of Democracy is a Good Thing. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, he was a vice minister level official, uh, now left the government position, uh, serve as a dean at the public policy at Beida. And uh, his views uh, may not uh, you know, uh, uh, be the same with the political establishment. So this kind of dissent uh, exists before and exists even now. So it's really not like a, uh, so that's why I agree with uh, Zhu Xiefeng's uh, comment. Now I also think that's important. Uh, the being of China studies, really uh, the giant, intellectual giant, the Zhang Ping fell back. And to certain extent, we are all his students. That he once said when he, in, the, in his 1983 book, he said that China is a journalist's dream and the statistician's nightmare. This is more so for the foreigners, for like people like from outside. I mean, fascinated by China, but they do not have the reliable data. Now, with China's think tank development, with China's really rapid development of China's academic disciplines, <clears throat> that problem actually, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, fixed largely by Chinese scholars. So I will explain that in just a few minutes. Now, let me go to the first question that I asked earlier. Now, certainly, it's a very, very important window for various reasons. First of all, I cited in the book, cited the uh, uh, chronological events. I only choose some of them here. Uh, actually, last party Congress already considered think tank or, the, or they call, calling for the improvement of the same making mechanism and the procedures exhibiting a greater role for think tank. This is the direct language from the 18th party Congress uh, uh, speech delivered by, by uh, uh, our leader. Then the important third platinum and, uh, in which uh, Xi Jinping made the claim that the building new types of think tanks with Chinese characteristics is part of China's strategic mission. So you enhance to that level. They also talk about software power, talk about revolving door, talk about uh, established 50 to 100 uh, uh, high-end think tanks. And finally, uh, Xi Jinping just uh, last year said that calling for strengthening international academic exchange at the research institutions and promoting scholarly collaboration between Chinese and foreign think tanks. That explains that we still got a lot of invitation by China, uh, despite the political tightness, and we maybe leave certain door open for think tanks exchanges. Now, these are the things we can listen more. This is from the top leaders, from the government resolutions. Now, Xi Jinping himself um, speak at the, spoke at the think tanks. This is what happened uh, in 2014 uh, in Europe, as Li Keqiang did several things in that year. Uh, previously, Chinese think, uh, leaders avoid this kind of speech. They, the best they can do is to go to universities, but now they went to think tanks Western. Now, this is my famous study by John, by uh, uh, James McCain at the UPenn. Uh, he actually, each year, gave a report. There's a large number of Chinese think tanks. Uh, according to him, the entire world has uh, 6,800 something think tanks. United States has the largest number of think tanks. You know, it's about 1,800. China is number two, uh, has uh, 435. Now, of course, this is debatable. I mean, how do you qualify the same time? But uh, again, this is considered as an authoritative uh, 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 annual study. Now, according to Liu Wei, uh, the director of the Development Research Center of the State Council, uh, about two years ago, he said that China actually uh, could have as many as 2,000 
think tanks, if you consider include those who work for the policy planning uh, in or uh, policy research office in the various government. Now, uh, there are some uh, clarification or some groupings. There are some of them are the government agencies, uh, some of them semi-official institutions like CARS. You can say CARS is one country for example, I would say probably uh, semi because some of their resources now increasingly from, from society, not necessarily from the government. <coughs> and the university-based think tanks, there's a real private think tank start to emerge. And there's also foreign joint think tanks. Uh, actually, Brookings uh, established our branch, uh, the Tsinghua, called Brookings Tsinghua Center. Uh, it's a joint venture. The Carnegie also had a branch uh, in Beijing, also at the Tsinghua University. <laughs> this is a, a really foreign joint think tank. And uh, sometimes it's confusion with the other things, like business consultancies, although in a certain sense, they should not be considered as think tanks. Uh, because think tank is the non-profit, you know, uh, non-commercial, uh, in a uh, kind of a uh, policy research uh, uh, institution should not be confused with a lobby group or business consultant firms. But in Chinese context, there's still a lot of ambiguities. There's also civil society groups, like Gongtou, that they also be considered as a think tank. Now, uh, this is you know, not details. My book has the details. You can still available uh, outside. Um, uh, Tsinghua University, a school has almost uh, I don't know the exact number, probably 70, 60 to 70 think tanks. Center, various think centers, almost of each department or each, okay, I mean, this is uh, actually a few years ago, they already have like 20 or, or 30, but now I think it's a, a 60 or 70, Tsinghua, we're actually planning to build a building, large, tall building, uh, host all kinds of think tanks together. So I don't know whether it's a good idea or bad idea, but that's a, a university. When the university have so many think tanks, now this is the top non-government think tank, started in uh, 1988 by Si Yuan, uh, an entrepreneur Cao Si Yuan. He passed away uh, um, a, few, uh, a few, few years ago. But it's really uh, quite uh, good in terms of tax reform, or study Chinese economic reform uh, by Cao Si Yuan. And uh, Yuan Yue is our friend, right? He, he conducted a lot of survey, opinion survey. It's uh, really China's uh, gallic proof. And uh, he started in 1992. Uh, uh, Strictly sense, this is more like a survey company rather than think tank, but uh, they shape uh, policy debate. Now, Tianzhe and Mao Yusi certainly always uh, raise uh, some criticism or, or, or voice some their criticism about the government policy. Sometimes they're banned, sometimes they're open. Now, more recently, you see, uh, like Wang Guiyao, uh, 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 who visited, frequently visited the United States, he was a visiting scholar. Then. At Harvard and also uh, uh, Brookings, uh, just a few years ago, he established the Center for China and Globalization. That uh, I think many of us visited in think tank. And also, there's one that's called Pangu. This is not a Pangu a company, but a Pangu Institution, uh, Pango Institute, and the Taihe Global Institute. That Steve and I just uh, visited uh, uh, two weeks ago, and uh, they could run really fantastic conference. They may be weak in the research. But they can run in conference. This is called a forum centric approach, and, uh, and they get uh, they can do much better than, than us, I should say. Yeah. Now, what other factors contribute to the rise of think tanks in China today? There are several reasons. One is the dynamics of leadership politics. They need for legitimacy. They they want to emphasize scientific decision making. They want to have their own staff. That's so it's a revolving door for them, and also China's rise. Uh, the things is become so complicated. There's a necessity and availability in a globalized uh, uh, world. This is including the China's uh, economic rise. You have financial support, uh, money, uh, whether by private sector or by SOEs. And also that uh, uh, this financial globalization becomes so complicated, you really should have a special knowledge and, uh, 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 to uh, understand what's going on and then for, uh, can uh, develop a uh, policy accordingly. There's also rapid growth of the commercialized media office. They want to commentate us, you know. So think tanks, this is the things they want. And uh, uh, like talk show fever, like the newspaper boom. And still, China's newspaper still, most of them still growing, I think very soon, they will experience some problems, this paper uh, 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 media. But so far, it's still okay. And the internet revolution also uh, requires uh, online 
this course, and some people uh, become self-made think tech thinkers or etc. Now, there's retainees, uh, foreign educated retainees. Um, uh, they study in the West, they return to China. Usually, they find think tank is the uh, is the first you know kind of employment. Then gradually, they fit in the Chinese society and etc. And uh, some of them uh, serve as advisors. Now, it's important to mention during the past two decades, top leaders' new ideas they really uh, come from from the, their advisors. For example, Zhang Zemin's represents really changed the definition of Chinese Communist Party, uh, uh, largely from the advice from Wang Fuying and from uh, Wang Fuying's colleagues at the Fudan University. Fu Jing calls peaceful rise of China. Uh, you cannot uh, say, um, uh, you, you really can easily can identify Zheng Dijian, former vice president of Central Party School, was really the brain for that idea, the peaceful rise. And uh, also Xi Jinping's one bill to one role and the founding of the AIIB, uh, really uh, contributed by Jing Yiquing, who is currently the president, and also the Chinese China Center for International Economic Exchange, so CI, uh, CCIE. So basically, I follow these think tanks, the major ones. You can trajectory, you make a trajectory about what the policies you want to adopt, at least uh, particularly the inferential think tanks. I basically, every day, I will have a list of think tanks. I will look at their, their, their website to see that anything going on, any meetings or any discussion. That could be extremely helpful. I hope that our China study communities, at least our intelligence community, should follow that very, very closely. Now, revolving door. These are the leaders retired, then move to think tanks, including famous Zheng Bijian. He is the head of the CCIEE, -E, I just mentioned. Zheng Bijian, uh, currently, uh, he is in his uh, later 80s, still running think tank. And uh, Dai Bingguo uh, is a very important figure as a state councillor, and um, uh, to a certain extent that uh, he contributed to the major power relations. And uh, uh, Zhao Qizhen was the head of the state council information office. And uh, he continued to play an important role in the people's to people relations. Now, this is the other way. It's, uh, the party leader, current party leaders come from think tanks, including Wang Funing and Liu He. I will, I, I will talk about this in a few, uh, in a few seconds. And the Xie Hu is the Henan party secretary. That's one very young picture of Liu He. He's not that old. His hair is totally gray. He's I'm sure you, I just saw him. Yeah, there's a reason. I mean, if you do not want people to dye their hair, a lot of them, they are all white. And, uh, but uh, Liu He does not uh, dye his hair. I, I know the reason. So he looks like that kind of old. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because the dyeing the hair look old. Yes, me. <laughs> okay. Then uh, Rong Guochang is the deputy director of the State Council uh, Research uh, Center. Uh, he actually was a visiting scholar at the Brookings, and um, a lot of opinion leaders uh, was a visiting scholar at the Brookings over the past two decades. Mm -hmm. They become influential leaders of think tank or even government leaders. Now, Wang Funing, uh, this is his background. Um, he actually is a candidate for Power Bureau Standing Committee. He is already in the Power Bureau. Uh, he advanced his career entirely from the same tech world, never serve as a local leader. You know, if you want to be China leader, you usually should serve as a provincial chief or, uh, or mayor or deputy mayor, but he never, only in university and then same tech. This entirely explains his career. He is a candidate for Power Bureau Standing Committee, although I would say 50-50 uh, uh, chance. The other person, Liu He, just mentioned, also advanced his career, very much like his uh, uh, friend, Zheng Pei, and also from think tech, uh, uh, on the information research and uh, uh, etc. It's not so much about the government the official, but rather uh, advisor. He is, a, as we know, the chief advisor for Xi Jinping economic affairs. He will be a strong candidate for vice premier and power bureau member. So you will see that uh, uh, these people really not only just a policy advisor, but they are they're becoming policy makers themselves. Now, these are two very important think tanks. If you want to understand Chinese economy, you should follow these two very, very closely. China. Uh, Chinese economists, 54, <coughs> including Liu He, Zhou Xiaofan, uh, uh, Yi Gang, and um, just name it, these 50 people, 20 years ago. I wrote, actually wrote a paper about this uh, institution about 15 years ago. So uh, these 50 people, they're so influential, they're all economists. <coughs> and uh, the younger one, the, this is China's financial, finance 40 forum, usually in their later 30s or uh, 40s. Uh, these are the upcoming leaders. And, uh, uh, 
a matter of uh, you know few years, they will become influential. So so look at this economic syntax. Now one thing you probably some of you know him. He actually did a great event. Wang Yiping, he is the deputy dean of the uh, National School of Development at Peking University. Look at this two years ago, more than two years ago, two and a half years ago, he uh, kind of make a recommendation China should establish called the Financial Stability Commission. Just uh, two weeks ago, the top leadership adopted that one. That institution will be above the four commissions become the most important financial decision making. But the ideas come two and a half years ago by Wang Yiping. So again, you do need to identify some opinion leaders and uh, these people, uh, what they said, it uh, might highly likely will become reality just in a matter of a few years. Now let me move to the second question. Is Chinese social science general, uh, research in general, and, um, and the think tank community in particular, really dynamic or pluralistic? Many people will be cynical, but my answer is yes. Now look at these different disciplines, like international relations, famous Yang Jie, uh, Wang Jie, uh, Wang, Wang Jie Si and Yan Shui Tong, Look at the political science. Uh, previously, I mentioned Yu Keping and also Fang Ning. Fang Ning is more conservative. Uh, he is the current director of the CAS in political science. And the economics like uh, Yu Yongbin and Hu Anggang. And then look at the role, He Weifang and uh, 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 Xu Xianming. Now, these two people, any peers, they have the almost completely different views about their discipline, about the relationship. For example, Wang Qi want to maintain a relationship with the United States. Yan Xiu said, no, the U.S. should be uh, considered as a major competitor, and that uh, we should be use military to uh, defend China's interests, completely different view. And Yu Keping said that democracy is the thing. China uh, cannot uh, become a real uh, great nation without democracy. And uh, Fang Ning said we not go that far. And he actually uh, think that the China model and uh, uh, should be uh, 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 prevail, should prevail. And economics, Yu Yong is very, very cynical, very, very pessimistic about Chinese economy. Fu Wang Gang always optimistic. Okay. And uh, He Weifang, law, uh, law, law professor, and uh, talk about constitutionalism is a solution for China's long term stability. And, uh, and uh, Xu Xiaoming is certainly thinking that the parties should still be above like, the constitution. Now, in sociology, this is the area that I just gave a talk in China. I mean, you see, Sun Liping is really think China, China is big trouble. And uh, society is so divided. And uh, it's very decayed. It will goes nowhere. But the other guy, and, uh, I think he's in Central Party School. And uh, uh, is really think China, China is big trouble. And uh, society is so divided. And uh, it's very decayed. It will goes nowhere. But the other guy, and, uh, I think he's in the Central Party School, and uh, uh, Xie Zichang, he said that the China, uh, Chinese economy, Chinese society is really become uh, very, very strong. So completely different views. But uh, these people are all quite influential. And uh, actually, I have difficulty to find people to criticize Sun Yiping, because this kind of view become dominant view in the discipline. Now let me also mention very dynamic research in sociology. One is on Chinese feminism, the other is Chinese middle class. Very quickly go through this. This is famous Li Yinghe. We invited him to speak at Brookings. And uh, uh, this is the, the title of the event, Women, Sexuality, and Social Change. Were you there? And Clara, were you there in meeting? Yeah. So you can see that it's fascinating. Uh, she certainly learned a lot. She was visiting, uh, got her PhD from Pittsburgh and really become the first uh, scholar on sexuality. And, uh, and actually, I have difficulty to find people to criticize Sun Liping because this kind of view becomes dominant view in the discipline. Now, let me also mention very dynamic research in sociology. One is on Chinese feminism, the other is Chinese middle class. Very quickly, go through this. This is famous Li Yinghe. We invited him uh, to speak at Brookings. And uh, uh, this is the, the title of the event, Women, Sexuality, and Social Change. Were you there? And Clara, were you there in meeting? Yeah. So you can see that it's fascinating. Uh, she certainly learned a lot. She was visiting, uh, got her PhD on Pittsburgh and really become the first uh, scholar on sexuality. And uh, very, very tough, very critical of the Chinese government policy. But uh, her views actually is still her. This is a panel by really diverse group of people. They can really 
talk about uh, a lot of things. Uh, we, we usually, at Brookings, we usually not talk about that. <laughs> you know, we don't talk about the, you know, I don't know, Zi Wei, women's uh, the masturbation, masturbation, I have difficulty to pronounce some of these things. So they're very shy to talk about that. But they can talk about it for 20 minutes. And all these 20 minutes, all this laugh, laugh, laugh. I mean, I, don't, I can say it's uh, never happened in Brookings' history. Brookings' <laughs> history. And you can check that video. You will see that the old people laugh all the time. And, uh, so, but uh, that kind of things. I mean, that, uh, she was a visiting scholar, uh, at, uh, I think in UC, UC Irvine, but uh, uh, she is a currently associate professor at the uh, Dongshan University in sociology. Now, this is uh, a famous Jing Xing. You know, this is most popular talk show, late night talk show. She is a transgender woman, and she did that uh, the uh, sex, uh, you know, surgery operation uh, 20 years ago. And this is what's, uh, uh, when she was he. Uh, then also, uh, I mean, again, the, the sociology development really contributed to the tolerance of Chinese society, and the society becomes so pluralistic. And in many ways, uh, 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 some of the things that are even more advanced than the United States uh, because of probably lack of religious, religious things that are in Chinese society. Now, I don't want to go detail, I can talk for a lot about uh, these, these issues. Of course, there's sometimes there's harassment, but just like the uh, uh, United States, there's a lot of harassment happening, uh, various things. But China, in short period of time, made so much progress in terms of social tolerance. Middle class, this is the, the articles uh, use that term from the 1980s to uh, later, to, to uh, the last decade. And uh, there are so many scholars made their name into middle class studies. I don't want the details. These are so many books. I calculated about five years ago, there's uh, almost 150, 120 to 150 books on middle class by various scholars. It's a series. The one scholar, Yi Chun Ying, herself, she herself uh, written, has written uh, three books. But the question is, uh, how many English language scholar books in the West on Chinese middle class? <laughs> the answer is almost uh, zero. Actually, I wrote the one. <laughs> and early on, I wrote another one in 1997. Um, I submitted to publish it. Uh, use the title, uh, Rise of Middle Class in Shanghai. This is based on my previous studies, it, it really uh, supported by Doug Burnett. And uh, I spent two years in China, 1990s. Then the title is Rise of China, Middle Class in Shanghai, but uh, got rejected by seven publishing houses. The reason is the same thing. The review said there's no such thing as called Chinese middle class. <laughs> and, uh, so that was 1997. Eventually, I published that year with a different title. I think all of you have wrote something nice. And uh, it's called Rediscovering China. But it's really about the middle class emerging from China. China but the people in this country so slow, so uh, have so much trouble to visit some of the concept. Now that my book in English is translated into Chinese and three years later. There's, of course, there's a couple of other books. This is by a professor uh, in UC system, Li Zhong, and uh, uh, he, I, I forgot that she or she also wrote that book. Now, yes, or, or Henry G, uh, genius uh, in terms of middle class. The second debate involved around the idea that the middle class must share a set of core values, if there's core values, like what? This is the second debate. And the third debate is the concept of the middle class political role and its relationship with the government. We support the government, political allies of government, or could potential challenges of government. These are the debates still going on in China. Now, I don't want to go into details about the importance. Then we move to the last issue. Does present-day China have great thinkers? Now, this is uh, uh, the whole discussion started about uh, 12 years ago by a famous uh, Chinese uh, scientist that later became the father of China's missile uh, uh, industry, Chen, Chen Xuesen. He asked a question to is the concept of the middle class political role and its relationship with the government. We support the government, political allies of government, or could potential challenges of government. These are the debates still going on in China. Now, I don't want to go into details about the importance. Then we move to the last issue. Does present-day China have great thinkers? Now, this is a, a, the whole discussion started about the, uh, 12 years ago by a famous uh, Chinese uh, scientist that later become the father of China's missile uh, uh, industry, Chen, Chen Xuesen. He 
asked a question in 2005 when in his conversation with Premier Wen Jiabao at that time. He asked why are Chinese schools not able to force the outstanding intellectual giants? And uh, China has not produced uh, world-class scientists and thought leaders. And someone followed that argue, some critics cited the absence of PRC educating the Nobel Prize winners in the science, sciences and literature as a key evidence supported changes in critical observation. Now, after he made that speech, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 important things after the debate, you see that the two really China educated, completely China educated uh, people uh, got the Nobel Prize, uh, not mentioning uh, someone earlier. Um, so that itself is a fascinating development. And uh, Yu Keping, uh, the person I just mentioned, he said that uh, China's momentous social economic transformation has not taken place in an intellectual vacuum. China's path to reform and opening up has been a process in which old and new ideas collect, uh, collide, and a continuous process where new ideas overcome the old. Such a great era has not only brought forth great ideas, but the reform and opening up itself is a product of this great liberation of ideas. Again, so I personally also believe that uh, in a country with this kind of change, drastic change, you cannot imagine could happen in an intellectual vacuum. The problem is because English dominates the world, sometimes overlook the dynamism in China. And the Chinese have difficulty to communicate with outside world uh, either. So that's why uh, I try to help with support by my uh, you know, big boss, John Sunken, wanted to introduce more Chinese scholars in various disciplines to American uh, uh, readership. These are the four volumes we already published. They all together will be 12 volumes. And uh, on political science, economy, law, and, uh, and uh, philosophy or ethics. Uh, we are work I'm working on the two very extensively with the help of our research assistant on um, uh, two other scholars, one is turning on youth and the uh, 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 on sex and, and gender. Now, so of course, this is a conclusion. I want to give uh, more time for discussion. That, uh, of course, there's some problems in China. Uh, we, like Brookings, we developed a think tank for you know, almost a decade. Uh, last year, we celebrated uh, Brookings' 100th anniversary. But China's same tank's history is just uh, 20 years as a max, or 30 years as a maximum after Deng Xiaoping. But the still early stage, the real emphasis only occurred in the past four or five years. So I'm not that pessimistic, but it is still they need to change, improve. Like a more balanced and pluralistic approach is, will be more effective. Uh, and also more open intellectual environment is needed. And I'm not happy with the current intellectual environment like many other Chinese friends. A better understanding of the outside world in general and the US is particularly essential. You see that some of the think tank discourse about the United States really not well informed, partly because American society becomes so complicated, American politics becomes so bizarre, and, uh, <laughs> but partly because uh, Chinese tend to not to do their hard work to follow up closely and, uh, and etc. And they still preoccupied some of the, some of the uh, 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 strategic uh, uh, a kind of misunderstanding uh, in my view. And the quality of English communication must be improved. And the uh, Chinese like to produce numbers, one built, one road, it's really represents for comprehensiveness. <laughs> this is not an American style. You need to use something else. I mean, the Chinese would, would always like numbers. So these are the things that they need to work on, uh, uh, use more effectively. It's unfortunate that the English word still dominates the word, unfortunately for us. And uh, it is uh, important to understand the difference between art and the propaganda. This is, I made a speech. And um, you can say that um, the all art could be propaganda to a certain extent. But you cannot say all propaganda are art. And uh, this is uh, particularly noticeable. Uh, some of the things that come from China is so weak because it's uh, such a poor quality. And uh, uh, they may have a good point, but it's just uh, completely uh, uh, not uh, well delivered. And but finally, I also wanted to emphasize the ultimate improvement of China's image. Because as we know, the think tank's approach, sometimes so called soft power, is more just tactical things. But I strongly believe the ultimate improvement of China's image, not the lines about this propaganda, but lies in social political progress at home. Just like Americans, if we want to improve our image, our soft power around the world, 
is not based on what someone said or someone wants to try to present, but the reality, American society, you know, overcome its own problem, make some progress. For more things to buy my book outside the discount, <laughs> and I will be happy to sign. Thank you very much. I think you have a sense of the remarkable optimism in this book. Um, let me ask a question that I actually asked during the podcast that Chung Lee and I did right before this, which is there's a chapter in this book which is really wonderful, and it's about one of your authors, Fu Wei Fang, and it's called Fighting for a Constitutional China Through Public Enlightenment and Legal Professionals, which kind of tells you the story. You start the chapter with a description of a meeting at Beida in the fall of 2011. Participants in this meeting, as Chung Lee describes it, are directly critical of the Chinese Communist Party's participation in the legal system, that the Zheng Fa Wei, the, the legal political committee, is far too intrusive. And this whole discussion occurs at Beida, and it's quite open and and it, you said it's televised, then. Or it's, Not televised, it's, it's but there's a video camera. The, yeah. the, the, it's recorded. 2011. Could that discussion happen today? <laughs> that particular discussion may not happen, may not be allowed to happen today. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm very optimistic. Let me tell you why. First of all, that, uh, um, you know, um, seminar, really quite eye-opening for me. But uh, later on, I started to edit her book again. 2010, 2011, I worked on that book. That book targeted three people. Wang Lijun, remember that? The police chief of Chongqing, the person de facto United States counselor. This is, uh, actually, I use that one open letter as the, uh, was the, uh, the, the beginning, the, the introduction. Uh, about that book, is the He Wei Fang's open letter to him. At that time, he was police chief. He, under the Wu Xilai's instruction, executed his predecessor. Then He Wei Fang said, "What happened to your predecessor will happen today. Will happen to you tomorrow." So I use that as the beginning of that book, with the, of course with the He Wei Fang's agreement. This is number one person he criticized. Number two is Wu Xilai. He said, you turn Chongqing as your own kind of kingdom. You completely ignore a uh, legal um, uh, 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 process. Uh, that's the thing is not acceptable. Uh, this you, if you uh, is moving to the top, it very much echo what Wen Jiabao said, uh, a cultural thing will come back. The third person he criticized is Zhou Yongkang. At that time, in charge of Zheng Bawei. Uh, the the politi political science and the law commission. Later, he became a standing committee member, very, very powerful figure. He, he we found said, I quote, it's only happened in China, the Superior Court judge should report to the police chief. <laughs> At that time, all these three people are in power. He we found wrote that book, working published. A couple years later, China's history speaks for itself. All these three people are in jail for life. He Wei Fang still can send his people, uh, although sometimes there's some pressure. So my point is that in this particular field, uh, Chinese political development will never be linear. You cannot compare this year with last year, with three years ago. You should look at the trajectory of history. The important thing is people may not be allowed to have that, um, that meeting. You can interpret it in a way uh, there's more competition or tension. The government fine. Maybe if you open, then you can com compete with, uh, you know, be some chaos. Of course, I'm not endorse that idea, but you can see the way of thinking. The criticism, the momentum becomes stronger and stronger. So at a certain point, they want to stop. But the doctor, they can completely stop this. And uh, yes, official media become control, but uh, there's always some interesting debate within the establishment. 
I mean, I'm really impressed, even by official media, some of the discussion, the quality of the, for example, CCTV America. It's not bad. I, I did a lot of live interview. No one tell me that you certain things you cannot say. But I can say a lot of things because my expertise about Chinese leadership. So I really appreciate that kind of things. So again, commercialized media will eventually lead society to become pluralistic. The legal profession is still developing. You, I just went and then some of you probably study about the Chinese uh, legal development, especially in the law school. I actually know many law school deans. I could say none of the law school deans are really very, very conservative. They all think that the constitutional development is essential for China's development. That gave me hope. You work for one of the great think tanks of America. <clears throat> Would you say independence is critical to Brookings' success? Absolutely. Uh, Are Chinese think tanks independent? Can they, in the current political environment, be independent and perform anything close to the role that American think tanks play? First of all, Brookings uh, has the three words of motto, <coughs> so you motto, is quality, independence, impact. So independence is our middle name. We care, care deeply about that. I have tremendous respect for my colleagues who try to maintain these three things. But uh, let me also make it very clear, we should not idealize American think tanks. Not all think tanks are independent. Some of think tanks have clear party line. Some of the think tanks are certainly driven by interest group. Let's face it. And uh, uh, does not mean that they want to undermine the, the importance, the values of independence. Now for China, I do believe that the Cao Siyuan and, uh, and Tianzhe, um, these are independent think tanks. I also think there's some, a lot of independent scholars, such as Yu Keping, He Weifang. And ironically, that the conservative intellectual is just a minority at the moment. In that regard, I also should show respect to them, because they're a minority. <coughs> Ironically, in the Chinese discourse. And uh, so the, my view is to my Chinese colleagues uh, in think tank world, it's not so much you should pursue independence in the short term, because it's not realistic. <laughs> the government will not let you really become too independent. You will face really uphill battles, like Cao Siyuan, like uh, 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 some of the you know, Tianzhe colleagues, etc. But the diversity is the value you should uh, uh, seek. Actually, Xi Jinping said that diversity is part of the new think tank development. I'm really uh, uh, happy with uh, when he said that. And so I was at this stage where you have diversity, you have competition with different views. The society will moving along. Even without think tank development, Chinese society has already become uh, uh, very pluralistic. So it's maybe not the long-term or maybe it's the only long-term goal you know, as independence, but short-term is a diversity. It's a more realistic strategy. Last question for me, because then I want to open the floor to questions. In um, the Chinese politics in the Xi Jinping era, you have this great data on uh, returnees as a percentage of um, members of the Central Committee and alternate members of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. Do you have similar data relating to leadership in think tanks? Oh, yeah. I mean, I did a study about the university presidents and the deans and uh, department chairs. Um, uh, the top schools, like uh, uh, 211 the school, this is the, the key, uh, 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 dominated by foreign educated Chinese. Dominated. And uh, also, uh, uh, Xi Jinping actually, um, you can see that in the 19th Party Congress, he particularly paid attention to two groups of people. One is entrepreneurs. These are state owned enterprise entrepreneurs, CEOs, particularly in aeros aerospace and uh, air plant industry. These people now move to the provincial leadership, like uh, Guangdong Governor Ma Xingrui. 
Heilongjiang Party Secretary, uh, Zhang Qingmei, and uh, Zhejiang uh, Governor, Yuan Xuejun. All of them speak good English, and uh, Yuan Xuejun's English could be environment for native speaker. And uh, uh, many of them also study overseas. And the other group is the university president, like uh, Chen Jining, the Qinghua president got his PhD from UK. And uh, his colleague, party secretary, uh, Wu Heping, got his PhD from Tokyo, now governor of Shanxi. These are all the rising stars. They are all born in the 1960s. Many of them are returnees. Some of them uh, may not be Xi Jinping's politicians, like uh, Chen Yulu, the, 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 the currently deputy governor of People's Bank, formerly president of University. You can see, I can give you the long list. These people move in. But for think tanks. Now, the think tanks that are really dominated by, by Western educated people, also as a visiting scholars, like, uh, you know, Jia Qingguo is a Cornell PhD, and uh, also a one year visiting scholar. And at Brookings, he is running uh, uh, Beijing University, it's an uh, international department that's also think tank. Okay, Wang Huiyao already mentioned, and then there's the long list of people in the government, outside the government, and etc. So uh, that's a, that's a, uh, uh, actually, I actually hope that there should be more mixed. It's not as good that all of them are Western educated. I think that some of the Chinese educated could also contribute to diversity. I think that uh, um, so long you are well informed, so long you are open-minded, and also let me also mention some of the Western educated uh, think tank leaders may not necessarily pro US, look at the entry at home. Yen Xue Tong got PhD from Berkeley. We had the same mentor, Bob Scalpino. Right? And, uh, but uh, overall, I do believe that the majority of people study work in the United States, majority, let me say that, has a relatively bad understanding of the United States and also appreciate the you know, kindness, the sincerity, and uh, the friendship of American people. I think they will have less misunderstanding with others. Any guess, by the way, on what the percentage of returnees will be in the 19th party time? I can tell you that uh, I have the chart in my, the other book. The 19th party time? <laughs> yes. You, you, you I really predicted in that yet. book. It's a book. It's a, a project, projected. Projection. Projection 17.5. 17.5. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that, uh, the book I wrote about it. Yeah, so that's, a slow, that's actually a slowing of growth. No, not slowing. It's a slowing uh, of growth from the... From I can tell you that uh, I have a chart in my the other book. <laughs> yes, you, you I really predict that yet. book. It's a book. It's a, a project, projected. Projection. Proje projection. Seventeen point five. Seventeen point five. <laughs> but uh, but uh, that, uh, the book I wrote about the year. So that's a slow, That's point. actually a slowing of growth. No, not slowing. It's a slowing uh, of growth from the from the from the from the 16th to the 17th to the 18th to the 19th. Uh, so it's actually uh, slower. Uh, 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 the percentage is, is going up, but it's going up at a slower rate. Oh, well, but these are uh, major, uh, major positions. You should look at that. Uh, the, central, the, the Central Committee. Yeah, just but some of the part I'm not talking about the Politburo, I'm not talking about the standing yeah. committee. The Senate, the 300, how many? 300? 76. So, uh, so actually, that, uh, I still calculating, this actually on the airplane coming here, I found that probably will be, will be uh, a little bit more than 17.5%. And because the military reshuffling is overwhelming. I mean, it's, it's a, almost a, a whole team. And, uh, I mean, the place, this is just announced. Just, right, I saw it. Just, uh, uh, and always also know the delegates. So uh, basically, you can project uh, yeah. uh, 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 with accuracy. And uh, last time, it's a 14.5, 18 party Congress. But uh, this 3% increase is not small. I would say, but the no, reality was five percent for the proof from the uh, probably yeah from yeah. The but uh, uh, seventeenth, eighteenth. Uh, let's see, but uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe uh, uh, half to two percent uh, could be added. But uh, I I'm, uh, I I think we're leaning towards a more high end. Let's open the floor to questions. Uh, right here. Um, thank you. <coughs> Sure, Henry Young with HHN Capital. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Dr. Lee, I think you have one slide. I, I don't recall the name of it. I think the, the author is Zhu uh, Xiaofeng or something to that effect. I don't remember the verbatim. I don't remember for verbatim, but I think the content was 
uh, the influencer from the think tanks do, are not, do not serve as small pieces for the uh, central government. Rather, some of them criticize the uh, central party's policies, so on and so forth. I think you agree with that statement. Assuming that's true, if the influencers from these think tanks, if they openly criticize the central party's policies, have you seen them being sort of um, in Queen House for address? Or, or monitor closely, maybe not to the effect of Liu Xiaobo, but you know, sort of to, to serve as a deterrent for furthering, uh, you know, disagreeing with the central parties. Uh, no, uh, from time to time you may see some cases, uh, but even these uh, well-known people, uh, for example, just uh, you see He Ruifang, you see. Uh, Sun Li Ping, they are very strong critics. They are, from time to time, they will have some trouble, but they still travel overseas, give speeches, and, uh, but um, these are very tough critics. Right. And, uh, but for uh, those in the same tanks, they may play around. They will not go that far, not like He Weifang's criticism. So this could be accepted, could be tolerated, so, you know, I talked to with, with some of my Chinese colleagues. I mean, you look at the Chinese university, the most famous professors, majority of them are quite liberal. Majority of them are quite liberal. So that's telling you a lot. It's not like uh, the time when I grew up in China. It's first of all, you think you're wrong, yourself wrong. Second, the, the atmosphere is so Repressive. It's a, It's a really unfair to compare today China with you know with the past. It's a different China. It's a very complicated China. There's tremendous room of openness. There's a lot of uh, uh, debate. A lot of uh, different uh, views. Uh, so when I read Zhu Xuefeng's work, I thought that he was right. That uh, but uh, not so many scholars you know, argue that way. But uh, I think that. Uh, does uh, not necessarily mean that it is wrong. I give you the examples in, in, in the recent past. You can see this is mainstream think tanks, but they have different views. Uh, it, today, it's still, still that. And so I do not think that uh, from time to time there will be some cases, there will be some difficulties. Uh, the so atmosphere, let me make it very clear, is not the conducive. That's why I argue that it should change. But the question is, that's temporary or long term? Or this reality, this, uh, could you say that there's some room for debate, for discourse, for thinking, independent thinking? I certainly agree with that. And I also hope, that's maybe my optimistic, uh, optimistic thinking come from, hope that this kind of uh, current tight control is only temporary. And, um, uh, as a country moving to more innovation-driven economy, I think that uh, you do need to the parallel openness, transparency, independence can go along the way. But uh, it may not be exactly the same time. Sometimes there's a sequence. Sometimes there's a political atmosphere you need to overcome you know, uh, uh, the challenges. So, uh, but uh, it will be uh, a mistake or oversimplification to argue nothing happening in China. There's no complete uh, independence at all. No. Martin. Yeah, um, Martin, you wouldn't come here from CUNY. Um, Lee Chang, I have about 100 questions for you, but let me just ask, on the last point, you kind of indicated that from your point of view, you expect this 19th Party Congress to be kind of a game changer in terms of following the last two Congresses. And I'm wondering if one could argue, why not that the 20th Party Congress or the 21st Party Congress, which may even have more of a bigger generational change, could be a real game changer? I'm curious as to try. Well, uh, I probably tend to agree with you, because I think that uh, that uh, generational change is, you cannot stop generational change in every country, in every society. It's, uh, it's not that it's just you, if you want to stop, you can stop. And also, that uh, let's go back five years ago to see American uh, mainstream thinking. 
The symmetric thinking is that the Xi Jinping, the first term, you should not expect much. You cannot have power. You cannot get anything done. Right? This is general thinking. I challenge that. I think that the, you will expect a really very big change. And you look at the anti-corruption. You look at the military reform. You look at the China's emerge as a as a, a, to the center stage of world affairs. These are all big changes. And uh, two year, three years ago, no one talked about innovation in China. Think like this country is terrible innovation. But now start people start to realize there's a, something going on in the innovation in China. It's real. So our China study community lag far behind. Lag behind for various reasons because China changes so fast. Lag behind because our academic discipline too much occupied with the rational models. This is what I said, or some other scholars said. You know, politi uh, economics become mathematics, political science become statistics. So these kind of things you out of touch with the reality, and we also not doing well because we lack of funding. Our international studies, language studies, are declining, not increase. So that all explain our poor understanding of the outside world. And uh, so I do believe that uh, the uh, next five years will be a lot of changes. Uh, whether it be political change, political reform, openness, including media, I certainly hope. I'm not sure, because it depends on, depends on the international environment. But Xi Jinping now has capital. Where he used his capital is important. I don't want to predict whether he will stay five years later or 10 years later. This is, I think it's a silly question. The most important is to see what will happen in the 19th Party Congress. What's the composition of the power of the That itself tells you the collective leadership is still with us. If there's no such a collective leadership, why bother to look at these standing committee members? Just look at Xi Jinping, that's, it. that's enough. And whether a successor will be identified, whether some of the rules will be followed, some of the other rules will be changed or even improved. Right? I mean, these are all, and what kind of uh, direction in a party amendment, a constitutional amendment in the case. These are all important. But at the moment, that's a, it's, a, it's just a rumor season. There's some of the rumors are completely groundless. Some said that the, the, the party of standing committee will be abolished. The, then there's a general secretary position to be abolished. It's not that easy. It involves serious, serious in intellectual political discussion in China. So this is based on poor understanding of the country. So I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about the 19th Party Congress. I'm op optimistic about the future Party Congress. And also Chinese Communist Party said, this is Chinese leader said, there's no guarantee the party will be with us forever. The only thing to survive is to change. It's constant to keep abreast of time. This is a Wang Funing constant to say to his bosses, whether it's Zhang Zemin, the Hu Jintao, and now Xi Jinping. So that's the momentum. That explains the party, despite what happened five years ago. It's a horrible time. I saw the party in really big trouble. But they fixed some of the problems. Some of the problems. The move forward. <laughs> I think that's a perfect note of optimism on which we unfortunately have to end because our time is up. But the book is available for sale outside and the author is available to autograph your copy. <laughs> so please join me in thanking Chung Lee for writing the book.